Couple of things before we get started. If you turn, if you're going to turn in an assignment late, make sure you let me know. Remind, otherwise I don't grade it. So those of you that ha that didn't turn in your 2.1 assignment, for example, by 7 a.m. this morning, then it is late. You need to let me know on remind. Um, from now on, I will be counting points off for late work. So make sure that you're turning these in on time. They're due the morning before after that day that I assigned it. Um, if you disputed a question and then you still got it wrong, I counted it incorrect, you have a chance to redo the assignment. You just have to let me know. I'm not going to count off points for that. It's just about getting better and, and fixing your mistakes. If I see that you're willing to do that, then I'm not going to be counting points off as long as you're keeping uh, on task. Any questions, guys? All right, let's get started for today. Today, we're still talking about the same time period, the period between 1200 and 1450. But today we're going to talk about the Mongol Empire, an empire that I alluded to yesterday when we talked about the Silk Roads. The Mongol Empire will establish the largest contiguous empire on the planet the world has ever seen. But before we talk about the Mongol Empire itself, let's talk about the Mongol people. The Mongol people, or the Mongols, originate from this region of the world. Can anybody identify what that region is? What region of the world is that? Not quite. Uh, Asia. Central Asia. So they come from Central Asia in a place that we call today as Mongolia. Just like the other peoples that we talked about that come from this region, the Turkic peoples, the Mongols originated as nomads. They were nomadic. That's the kind of lifestyle that they lived. They moved from place to place. Very similar to the Turkic peoples that will eventually take over Dar al-Islam or the Muslim world. In the beginning, the Mongols didn't really pose much of a threat. Even though they were formidable warriors, the Mongols were divided into several different tribes. So they were divided into several different tribes. And they would often fight one another. They would be rivals of each other and they would be warring against one another. So divided, they didn't really pose much of a threat. Until during this period of time, the beginning of the 13th century, one of the leaders of the Mongols uh, was able to unite all of the Mongol tribes together. Anybody know his name? Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan was able to unite all the several Mongol tribes together. And now they become very dangerous as a united people. This is actually the wrong pronunciation of his name. This is the white European way to pronounce it. His, it's, his actual name is Chinggis Khan. Uh, but this is how I'm going to refer to him because this is what we're familiar with in the West. Now, the Mongol Empire will carve up the largest empire the world has ever seen. They will defeat armies that are multiple times larger than them. They will defeat armies that are more technologically advanced. They will face civilizations that were wealthier, that were more advanced than they are. They will face the Chinese. They will pay, face the, the Muslims. They will face Europeans. And one by one, they're all going to fall to the Mongols. But what made them so effective on the battlefield are two things. One, Mongols are born to be on horseback. Their horseback riding or their horsemanship is very, very skilled. Since you were a little kid, Mongol males and females are expected to learn how to ride a horse. And they live most of their lives on horseback. And they were very good at archery. Very accurate. They use something called a compound bow. Mongol battle tactics often can be characterized as hit and run. So they would face armies much more advanced than they are, much more technologically advanced, and sometimes even larger. Thousands of Chinese troops, Europeans, Muslims, they will face in the battlefield. And oftentimes, this is how it's going to work. Mongol horse archers will pepper the enemy army with volleys and volleys of arrows. When the enemy uh, army gets pissed and starts chasing them, what do they do? They run away. They retreat. And Mongols, especially the skilled one, are trained to be able to, while they're running away, to be able to shoot back at their enemies. So while they're running away, they're still shooting at their enemies. And because they're very fast, their people can never catch up to them. And this is how they were able to build their empire. 
The second thing that they were good at is siege craft. Cities back then were surrounded by walls, and the Mongols were very good at overcoming that obstacle. So siege craft is another way they were able to establish their empire. Horseback riding, archery, and siege craft. Those are the foundations of the Mongol Empire, enabling them to beat armies much larger, much more advanced than they are, and conquer civilizations that they are not, they're not close to in terms of technology. <clears throat> all right. So what regions did they conquer? Well, all of that. Basically, much of Eurasia. The Mongol Empire extends from East Asia, places like China and Korea conquered by the Mongols. They even attempted to conquer the Japanese, um, but a storm kind of threw away the Mongol navy. Central Asia will also fall to the Mongols. Persia, what is now Iran, and the Middle East will fall to the Mongols as well, the Muslim world. And Eastern Europe will also fall to the Mongol Empire. And by 1279, the Mongols have carved up the largest empire the world has ever seen. Throughout this conquest, the Mongols earn their reputation for brutality. Whenever they come across a city that they will conquer, they give them two choices, surrender or die. When cities surrender to them, they're very magnanimous. They were very kind to them. But more often than not, they do not. And when they defeat them, they kill all the men and they sell all the women and children to slavery. Throughout the Mongol conquests, 40 million people are going to die. They're going to kill 40 million people throughout Eurasia. And remember, during this time, it's not like today where there's billions of billions of people on the planet. There's uh, far less people living on the planet back then. 40 million people over the course of about 40 years. That's a huge percentage. That's a significant percentage of the population killed by the Mongols during their conquests. They were very brutal. They were very violent. However, once things settled down, once they were able to establish what is now the Mongol Empire, and now it's time to rule, they took a very different approach. For a brief moment in history, for about 100 years, across Eurasia, the Mongols will establish peace and stability. Peace and stability across Eurasia and the places that they conquered. Even though they were brutal conquerors, they were very peaceful rulers. This is a brief period of time that we refer to as Pax Mongolia. Pax Mongolia means the Mongol peace. It will last for about a hundred years. And during this hundred years, they limited wars. There's a lot of trading that's happening between the different parts of the empire, between different regions of the world. And cultural exchanges and the spread of culture was happening all throughout the Mongol Empire. So for 100 years, Eurasia saw some stability, saw some peace under Mongol rule. Any questions so far about the Mongols? Genghis Khan will die during this conquest. And once he died, the Mongol Empire will be divided. It will be fragmented into what we call the Mongol Khanates. It just means kingdoms. Each one of these Khanates are ruled by one of Genghis Khan's grandsons. There's four of them in total. So once he dies, the Mongol Empire is still the Mongol Empire, but it will be ruled by different grandsons, different canates. We'll talk about them very briefly right now. <clears throat> First, we have this part of the Mongol Empire, what is now Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, places like um, the Ukraine. And what's over here, guys? What country is right there right now? Russia. Russia. So Eastern Europe, including Russia, was conquered by the Mongols, and it will be ruled by a canate known as the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde was ruled by one of his grandsons named Batu, Batu of the Golden Horde. And they will rule much of Eastern Europe and what is now Russia. 
But back then, there was no such thing as Russia. Russia wasn't a country. <laughs> Instead, what Russia was back then was a collection of independent city-states like Novgorod, Kiev, and Moscow. They were independent city-states, and the Mongols will conquer them all. But here's a theme in the Mongol Empire. Oftentimes, the Mongols were not interested in ruling these places that they conquered directly. It's just too much for them. So instead, they allowed these places that they conquered to be semi-independent. They're not going to rule them directly. What do you think they'll ask for that semi-independence? Tribute. So these Russian city-states right here became tributary states for the Mongols. And for hundreds of years, Russians had to pay tribute to the Mongols. This is why, actually, why Russia became a country. These Russian city-states became so sick and tired of paying these tribute to the Mongols that they decided to unite together, form a country, and fight the Mongols together and drive them away from Eastern Europe. <clears throat> but that's not going to happen until later on. All right, next, we have the Ilkhanate. This one you will see a lot on your exam. The Ilkhanate is the Khanate, the, king, the Mongol kingdom that ruled over this portion of the Mongol Empire. This will include Persia, what is now Iran, and the Middle East. And here's another theme on, in the Mongol Empire. What you would expect is as the Mongols conquered these people, that Mongol culture, their language, their religion will spread throughout Eurasia. That didn't really happen. Mongol culture did not become a dominant culture. It did not really spread to the people that they conquered. What actually happened is the opposite. What happened was the culture of the people they conquered will blend with Mongol culture. And the Mongols will kind of assimilate and take in the culture of the people that they conquered. So those of you who are a little smarter in this class, the Mongols that ruled in the Ilkhanate, what aspect of the culture in this part of the world do you think they're going to take? Islam. Islam. This is the Muslim world. And many of the Mongols in this part of the Mongol Empire actually converted to the, the religion of the people that they conquered. So the Mongol elites, many of the Mongol elites in this part of the, uh, of the empire converted to Islam. Even the leader of the Ilkhanate eventually became a Muslim. And this is happening all throughout the Mongol Empire. The Mongols kind of assimilating, becoming Buddhists, becoming Christians assimilating to the culture of the people that they conquered. This one we're not really going to talk about. This is the Jangatai Khanate. It's the least important. Out of the four, they ruled over Central Asia. They ruled over Central Asia. The most powerful of these Khanates and the most powerful of the Khans, the most powerful of Genghis Khan's grandsons, is this next guy right here. His name is Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan will be the successor to Genghis Khan. And he will conquer much of what is now Eastern Asia. And what's not there anymore? What used to be here? The Song Dynasty, Song China. The Mongols will destroy China or Song, the Song Dynasty. <clears throat> the Mongols will wipe away the Song Dynasty. It will lead to the collapse of the Song Dynasty. And in their place, the Mongols will rule China. Kublai Khan took a very smart approach in ruling China. Instead of replacing Chinese systems, he figured a lot of the things that the Chinese are doing are working. Song China was very prosperous. Their government was functioning very well. So instead of replacing it, I'm just going to copy it. I'm going to copy what the Chinese are doing. So what Kublai Khan did is he emulated, he copied Chinese systems, political systems. Instead of replacing them, he adopted them. Like, for example, look at the name of his Khanate, the Yuan Dynasty. So he will copy that tradition of dynasties ruling over China, like the Song Dynasty, and he will establish his own dynasty called the Yuan Dynasty. But unlike the dynasties in the past, the, the Yuan dynasty is not ruled by, China, by Chinese people. It's going to be ruled by Mongols. It's going to be ruled by foreigners. And just like the dynasties of the past, he will claim that the Mongols have the mandate of heaven. 
authority from the Chinese gods to rule over China. The mandate of heaven. So he's adopting Chinese customs. And he will also adopt something that we talked about in class, the Chinese imperial bureaucracy. The way of government that they already had in China. Well, you have an emperor on top, and you have government officials executing the will of the emperor. But he didn't adopt everything. There are some things that he was different from the Chinese. One of the most, most notable things is he kind of phased out the civil service exams. One of the mainstay of the Chinese government of the past, of the Chinese dynasties of the past, are these civil service exams. Under the Yuan dynasty, those civil service exams were kind of phased out. The Mongols appointed, um, instead of scholars that run the government, the Mongols appointed foreigners from different parts of the empire, like Persians and Turks. They brought them into China to help them govern and to help them rule China. Who's not going to like that? China being ruled by foreigners, the Chinese, especially the scholars who used to be on top of Chinese society. So there's going to be some dissatisfaction, especially amongst the native Chinese. All right. The Mongol Empire will not last long for the grand scheme of history. The Mongol Empire was only here for a very brief moment. About 150 years, they will establish that 100 years of peace, and then as if um, suddenly the Mongol Empire will collapse. And there's many reasons for that, but there's two main reasons. Number one, those Khanates that I talked about, they end up fighting each other. They will succumb to infighting and civil war. So these Khanates, the successors to Genghis Khan, will end up succumbing to civil war. And they will weaken the Mongol Empire as a result. They'll start fighting one another. And what finally puts the nail in the coffin of the Mongol Empire is the spread of disease. The most notable one would be the most devastating one during this period of time, which would be the what? The Black Death or the Bubonic Plague. Very good. Despite the fact that they were just here for a very brief moment in history, the Mongols will left a, leave a lasting impact, especially in Eurasia and the places that they conquered. This is your job for today. What is the impact of the Mongol Empire? You need to know several examples of how the Mongol Empire impacted the places that they conquered. First, the Mongol conquest will lead to the overthrowing and the destruction of many of the older states that we've talked about in class. This is the answer to one of your questions today. During the Mongol conquest, they will destroy many of the long-standing states, long-standing empires. We talked about one already in East Asia. What did the Mongols destroy there? Which state did they destroy there? The Song Dynasty. A very powerful state, gone. Destroyed by the Mongols. In the Middle East, they will destroy a state that at this point, before the, even the Mongols, it's already struggling, but it used to be a once powerful Arab Muslim state. It oversued the Islamic Golden Age. Its capital is Baghdad. Anybody remember what it's called? It's an Arab state. It's an Arab empire. So it's with an A. It's ruled right, right here. <coughs> it's called the Abbasid Empire. So the Mongols will finally put them out of their misery. Before the Mongols are already like declining, but the Mongols will finally put an end to the Abbasid Empire. That picture right there depicts the time where the Mongols sacked the capital city of the Abbasid Empire, Baghdad. They will burn a building that we talked about in class, the House of Wisdom, where a lot of learning took place. They will burn that to the ground. And this will signify the end of the Islamic Golden Age. They will also kill the caliph, so they will burn Baghdad for the Abbasid Empire, burn their capital, destroy their capital, and they will kill the leader of the Muslim world because they saw him as a threat to their power. So they will kill the caliph. 
Another empire that was put an end by the Mongols, this is something that you need to put as examples, is a Turkic empire. One of the Turkic empires that we talked about, the Seljuk Empire, will also be conquered and annihilated by the Mongols as well, also in the Middle East. So you need to know some of these examples of states that vanish because of the Mongols. Song Dynasty, Basid Empire, Seljuk Empire. All right. Another thing that the uh, Mongol Empire um, impacted was trade. Did the Mongols have a positive impact on trade and, or negative impact on trade across Eurasia? Very positive because they actively promoted trade. So the Mongols actively promoted trade. During that 100 years of peace of Mongol rule, they promoted trade actively, especially in which trade network that we talked about yesterday, the Silk Roads. They were very actively promoting trade because they know the more trade that takes place, the more income that the Mongols can get, the more taxes they will be able to incur. So that's why they were very active in promoting trade throughout their empire. They have an economic incentive. How did they promote trade? They provided stability across Eurasia, where there's not a lot of wars happening. Peace, stability, because almost all of Eurasia is ruled by the Mongols. Second, they help secure trade routes, especially the Silk Roads. Anybody remember how from yesterday? Soldiers, they posted soldiers along the Silk Roads to protect um, travelers and merchants along the Silk Road, to make it more secure, encouraging more trade. And they also built roads along the Silk Roads, making it easier for people to travel, paved roads. They established a road system. Next, what would make it easier for people within their empire to do business with one another? That starts with a P. Paper money, very good, whoever said that. Paper money, they adopted paper money as a form of currency, allowing the people of, of their empire to trade easier. And they established rest stops along the Silk Roads where travelers and merchants can stop, resupply, making the journey a lot safer, extending uh, the amount, the distance of travel. Anybody remember what they were called? Caravanserais, very good. Remember? The word, please, because it's going to be on your exams. Caravanserais were established across the Silk Roads. Again, all of this to serve to promote trade. Something that we're going to mention again in the near future. Oh, before that, this is a picture commissioned by Kublai Khan. If you all remember, Kublai Khan is the leader of the Yuan Dynasty, uh, part of the Mongol Empire in China. Whenever you see pictures like this on your exam, whether it's short answer or multiple choice, always look for the motive. These are very expensive to commission. So there's, there's a motivation for why they would commission these pictures. Oftentimes, it's to promote legitimacy, to show off how powerful they are, how strong they are, how legitimate they are. If you look at what's in the background, what's in the background? Traders, you got camels and merchants traveling. Why did Kublai Khan commission this? Because he wanted people within the Mongol Empire to see the Mongols as people that respected and promoted what? Trade. This is going to be on your exam. <coughs> Another thing that will be on your exam that we'll come back to later on, because it's an important concept, as the Mongol Empire expanded, they brought more and more people into their economic systems. So the Mongol Empire, for example, is participating in the Silk Roads. The Mongol Empire starts right here, conquers China, and then it conquers more and more territory. As it conquers more and more territory, it's incorporating more and more people into its, its ex ex existing economic systems, existing economic trade networks. So more and more people are participating in the Silk Roads. Not only do you have Asian people, now you have Central Asian people, now you have Indians, now you have Persians, now you have Middle Eastern, now you have Europeans participating in the Silk Roads. So here's the basic idea that you need to take away from this. As empires expand, not just the Mongol Empire, we're going to talk about different empires in, in the future. As empires expand, they incorporate more people into their existing economic systems. Write that down somewhere, please. As the Mongol Empire expanded, 
they incorporated more people, more resources into their existing economic systems. That includes trade. So as the Mongol Empire expanded, more and more people are participating in the Silk Roads. More and more resources are going to be part of the Silk Roads. Products became more widely available to distant markets. Now, because of the Mongol Empire, Russians are able to buy Chinese products. Muslims are able to buy Indian products because of the Silk Roads. All right. Any questions so far? All right, look at number two for me. Don't just tell me. Um, the Mongol conquest led to the destruction of several states or long-standing states. Make sure you provide specific examples. I think what I'm seeing on the class companion today for my first to third period is that if you only provide one example of a state that got destroyed because of the Mongols, it's going to count it wrong. So provide at least two, and that's probably how they're going to count it right. So you have two questions right now. You got five minutes. Don't just tell me the Mongols affected trade in Eurasia in a positive way. Give examples. How? What, was some, what are some of the ways that they promoted trade, encouraged trade? Yes, sir. No worries, I haven't taken attendance. Guys, those of you that were late today, there's going to be a video posted, so just watch the beginning of the lecture. So you're not behind. <coughs> All right, guys, try to focus. You got a lot of time. Some of you that are off task right now didn't turn in your homework yesterday. Got to focus, guys. Help each other. Ask me for help. Just don't give each other the answers or that's not going to help them much on the exams. Teach each other. Give you about three more minutes and then we'll move on. If you're not getting the lecture, read, ask questions. You have notes that are available for you. Don't be content with not knowing stuff because exam time comes and you bomb the test.
All right, two minutes. <clears throat> Man, laugh, guys. Those of you using your Chromebooks, close them for right now. I'll let you continue later. Try to focus. All right. The Mongols also promoted interregional communication, communication between the different parts of their empire. The Mongols encouraged travel. They wanted the people that they conquered to travel to the different places of their empire, trade, and communicate with one another. Under Mongol rule, places that before the Mongol Empire, had no contact with one another, they started establishing diplomatic relationships. They started sending emissaries, ambassadors, what we call diplomats, and establishing contact and relationship with each other. With each other. Now you got Muslims talking with the Chinese. You got Chinese people talking with the Russians. Now you have communication all throughout the empire happening. Travel all throughout the empire happening as well. Well, a specific example of this would be Muslim scholars. A lot of them traveled to China. A lot of them became part of the new Chinese government in the Yuan dynasty. And what do these Muslim scholars have with them? Knowledge, knowledge Islamic knowledge, Greek knowledge, that will, they will then pass on and transfer to China. Whenever you have people from different parts of the world interacting with one another, cultural exchange, the spread of culture, cultural diffusion happens. Speaking of cultural diffusion and exchange, this is another thing that resulted from the Mongol Empire. They encourage cultural exchange and cultural diffusion. <clears throat> By the Mongols promoting trade, promoting travel across the empire, and promoting communication with the different people of the empire, inadvertently, they're promoting cultural exchanges and cultural um, transfers. So by promoting trade and by uniting Eurasia under one political entity, they're encouraging cultural exchange and cultural diffusion. You need to know some examples, specific examples of technology, language, um, music, religion being spread and being exchanged. So one specific example that we can talk about is something we already talked about, Greco-Islamic knowledge from the Muslim world, from the Middle East, that are now part of the Mongol Empire, will spread throughout the Mongol Empire. A lot of it will end up in China, they'll end up in India. Knowledge, essential knowledge, like the works of Aristotle, the concept of zero, algebra, trigonometry, advancements in science, these are things that are going to spread. <coughs> Medicinal knowledge, like the Muslims' knowledge about the human anatomy, for example, these are things that will spread. And some of it will end up in Europe, where the Europeans will use that knowledge to trigger and initiate what? 
their own golden age of learning called what? The Renaissance. Another example that I forgot to put on your notes, but please write it down. Something we talked about yesterday, the transfer of Chinese technology. The transfer of Chinese technology. Tech from China will work its way and spread across Eurasia, across the Mongol Empire. Even some of it ending up in Europe, all the way to Europe. Examples include something we talked about yesterday. What is that? Gunpowder. The civilizations that will borrow that technology will advance that technology into the weapons that we have now. Cannons and firearms will be developed thanks to the Chinese technology that spread because of Mongol rule, because of the Mongols promoting interaction and cultural exchanges. Um, what else did we talk about yesterday? What's that? Paper making. Something that we didn't talk about yesterday. The Chinese invented a way to print. It's a very old system of printing. This is called a printing block. It's usually a piece of wood or a piece of ceramic with, in, with um, letters carved up or characters carved up into them. It works like a stamp. They'll ink the wood block and then they'll put it against a piece of paper and that's how they would print. This is something the Europeans will borrow and they will mechanize and that would lead to the printing revolution in Europe where they start printing Bibles and books. But the original technology comes all the way from China. And because of the Mongols and the Silk Road, that technology will spread all the way to Europe. Another one would be here. What's that? The compass, which is something invented by the Chinese, eventually will spread. So technology will spread. We talked about religion. And this is something that's often asked on your AP exams. The Mongols were very tolerant. They were very religiously tolerant. They did not try to impose their own religion on the people that they conquered. Here are some of the ways that they were tolerant. One, religious institutions like churches for Christians. What do you call the equivalent of a church in the Islamic world? What's their places of worship called? Like we have one, I think, in Ware Road. Somebody said it, a mosque. So you got Christian churches, you got mosques. Write this down if you don't know what this word is. This is basically their equivalent of a church, a mosque, a place of worship for Muslims, for, for Islam. Buddhist temples. It doesn't matter what religion. These religious institutions in the Mongol Empire are untaxed. The Mongols did not tax them. Because they were very tolerant of other people's religions. And many Mongols converted to the religion of the people that they conquered. Like those in China, many of the Mongol elites in China in the Yuan dynasty converted to Buddhism. And Buddhism became very popular uh, amongst the Mongols. And we talked about the Ilkhanate already. The Khanate that ruled over the Middle East and Persia, many of the people there converted to Islam. They were affected by the people, the culture of the people that they conquered. This is a depiction of the ruler of the Ilkhanate converting from Buddhism to Islam. And this is a picture of Kublai Khan, the leader of the Yuan dynasty, the Mongol leader of the Yuan dynasty, accepting Christian missionaries into China. <clears throat> All right. Now, because of an increase in trade and travel, and communication between people, religions will spread. And I told you three religions benefited from the Mongols and the Silk Roads in particular. What are the religions? Islam, Is Christianity, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism. Very good. Islam, Christianity, Buddhism. An inadvertent consequence of more people from different parts of the world interacting with one another, more traveling happening, is the spread of disease. Diseases will spread further and a lot faster because the people in the Mongol Empire are trading, they're communicating, they're traveling all across the Mongol Empire. Um, the Mongols promoting trade. The consequence is the spread of diseases. As people from different parts of the world traded with each other more, traveled more, and communicated with one another more, that's going to help the spread of disease. Diseases will spread farther, it will spread much faster because you have interaction between different people from different parts of, of the Mongol Empire. So the Mongols promoting trade, promoting travel,
promoting communication between the different parts of their empire will help diseases spread. Not only that, the Mongols themselves and the armies on their way to conquest as they travel across Eurasia in their path to conquest. Many of the Mongols carry diseases. Their horses carry diseases. As they traveled across Eurasia, they will help spread those diseases as well. That's going to be on your exam. Make sure you remember that. So as the Mongol army itself traveled during their conquest of Eurasia, they were carrying with them diseases that they will help spread. Not on purpose, but inadvertently. What's an example of a disease that spread during this time, helped by the Mongols? Black Death, or the bubonic plague. All right, here's your last question. Don't just tell me they help spread religion. Give me a specific example. Don't just tell me the Mongols help spread knowledge and technology. Specific evidence, please, specific examples. You can provide two. 